Hello, and thank you for joining us for game six of the day as Gambit versus Chaos Latin game is where each of these teams are aiming to end day two second in their group. It's been kind of a tough start so far, both picking up an early loss, but they can, of course, pick up that win here and look ahead, try and finish again that second spot to get themselves out and into the best of five. Yes, they certainly can. They're going to want... Uh, they're going to want to get themselves a big win here. KLG, um, they definitely struggled against G-Rex. They lost the fastest Baron of the plane so far, and then they quickly got demolished afterwards. And then for Gambit, uh, they had a little bit more of a fight up against G-Rex. They found a couple of good picks, but unfortunately they kept trying to put themselves into fights that they just couldn't win. So I'm hoping for Gambit they don't pick that much scaling this time around because we know that or expecting KLG to be able to play through the early game. And I don't know if Diamond Prox will track Tear Wolf as well as um, Empty was earlier in the day. Well, we'll have to see, of course, both these teams, despite the junglers having slightly different styles, are going to be relying and looking to them in that early game. But bands are done to quickly recap. Skarna, Varus, Camille, Aatrox, Poppy, and Rakan, which leaves first pick Alistar, of all things. Interesting. So they want that engage on the side of Gambit. I feel like the, with the Braum nerfs and with the Tom Kench nerfs, Alistair is just kind of considered the strongest support right now in the current meta. Morgana has been considered kind of one of the answers, but Braum is one of the kind of go-to. This will leave the Akali open. So our first Akali of the playing stage. I'm excited to see Plugo on that. And KLG gonna lock themselves in a very early AD carry for Fix. So a bit of a shift from what we saw earlier where they kind of locked in the Zaya Rakan against GRX, got themselves a strong 2v2 down the bot lane, going for a bit more of a scaling this time around. Excited already with how this game is shaping up. Nice to see Akali there. And I think Plugo is a player that went up. Oh. For KLG, and even MSI this year did look quite impressive, had some strong individual moments, so is a player that can carry for this team. And like you mentioned, Kaiser always good to get. But I like this as well. It's kind of a change up in what I assume is jungle, especially Ooh. with that Galio picked up. Talia here for Diamond Prox. Looks like it. And definitely a big change up for Gambit this time around. They put a lot of focus on Gragas, Tristana, and Orn the first time round. And this does mean that. Uh, that they've now gone for more of a side lane threat. So I don't think they're going to be looking to play through mid when you have a Talia who's great at roaming around the map. And you compare that up with the Galio as well, who is also great at roaming around the map. It kind of says, hey, we want to roam around the map. Yeah. <laughs> Well, where do they go? They need maybe top and bot lane to be completed. They did also give over Urgot to KLG as a result of how they approach this draft and actually will ban Tristana here. So again, maybe expecting Gambit to be giving Lodic some comfort. I like the fact that the Urgot pick is picked up for KLG. I feel like that they've just got themselves a lot of strong champions. You know, Kaisa, Akali, Urgot, kind of considered three of the strongest champions yep. in the current meta. And while Akali did receive some small nerfs on patch 819, she's still very lethal. In the first couple of levels, you can look to kind of punish her, given that she doesn't have the best wave clear and she doesn't have kill threat. But the moment she hits level six against most mid lane matchups, she does have kill pressure. And while the Galio can kind of mitigate that, he is still a melee mid lane mage that can suffer a lot of harassment from a Carligan. Before he's able to build some magic resistance, he needs to be very careful. So I wouldn't even be surprised if we saw KLG go for um, something pretty aggressive in terms of the jungle and just look to hard camp mid in the early stages of play. Yeah, I think certainly a strategy that can be effective. So two jungle bans as a result from Gambit, Gragas, and Olaf taken away. This would also be a pretty good aggressive look in the bot side of the map. I'd be very surprised if they went for Pike because the thing about Pike is he's great at roaming around the map, but Kaisa's not the kind of champion you can abandon in lane because then she's the one that's going to get dived. So I think Brawl makes a lot more sense, much better uh, and geared towards team fighting, which is where Kaisa specializes in. And it's a good matchup into the Alistair as well. So now if you're looking at Gambit, I'd love to see a bit of a carry from Stasios. During the regular season, he played a lot of things like Gangplank, Aatrox, he liked Scion as well. Like he had a pretty deep champion pool. And with the way that things are going, I feel like that we are gonna see more of a carry style champion towards the top side of the map. I like this as well. Lot of gonna take the Lucian and try and get aggressive in their 2v2. And like you mentioned, maybe Stasios gonna change it up away from the tanks and perhaps onto a fighter as Darius is going to be hovered. I don't know if I like Darius into the Urgot. One of his big issues is closing the gap um, with whoever's in front of him. And you got to remember that 
while Urgot isn't the most mobile champ, he does have that dash. And he's got a pretty fatty slow on his Q as well. So they're instead just going to go for more of the kind of lane dominant tank in Scion. So the damage is a little bit low, but fortunately they do have the Talia in the jungle and the Lucian as well. So solid early game damage. And you are very much setting up for kills around the bottom lane. Like you are looking for dives. You have Alistair who's great at tower diving. You have the Galio ulti to act as support. And Gambit definitely much more of an early game focused comp. Whereas KLG, they kind of have elements of scaling and also elements of early game. You know, at level six, Akali plus Kindred, devastating two versus two duo. And you can just blow up that uh, Talia before she can even move. Um, but at the same time, this team doesn't have great engage tools and they don't actually have many options to start fights off. So for KLG, I expect a lot of focus around the middle lane, trying to get the Akali head working together to try and get this assassin snowballing. However, for Gambit, it's all about bot lane. Just camp that bot lane. Once you hit your ultimates, look to try and dive, get your team comp ahead through the bottom side of the map and then use your early pressure to snowball into a solid mid game. So definitely big changes from what we've seen so far earlier in the day. And the question is who will be able to better execute upon their new draft style. And again, a very important game for both these teams as well. Never feels good to go 0-2 on your first day of Worlds. You want to keep the hopes alive and give yourself an easier path. So we'll see which team is going to emerge victorious here. But it is fun again to also see adjustments from these teams. And you have to be real quick when you're adjusting to the meta at Worlds. It often evolves game to game. So I like seeing these teams make some of the changes. And I'm excited to see Plugo kind of given the most agency on his team. I think we talk a lot about Teof and how good he is. And uh, understandably, the team plays with and around him often on his aggressive picks. But I think Plugo has the ability to really take over a game. And on Akali, you're kind of being said, you know what? Take over this game. Because if you don't, we may struggle. It's very, very true. And we'll see how he's able to do on it. Remember that both of these teams are currently sitting at 0-1 in their group. Both were uh, pretty handily defeated by G-Rex. And they currently sit at 2-0. and zero. Now, both these teams will want to find a win just because it makes making it into the play-in playoffs that much easier. Starting off 0-2. Um, just makes your life really difficult, to be honest. Uh, so they're going to want to avoid that. And the fact that KLG bring out the assassin in the mid lane, Akali, one of my favorite champions. I absolutely love playing. And even though many do consider Galio a good pick into her, I strongly believe that in the early levels, you can really bully that Galio hard. Just because um, Akali thrives in short range matchups. Um, perhaps not in the dance off. I do feel like the Galio has the better moves in that scenario. Uh, but the thing is, because she has so much spammability on her Q, the sustain she gets, the damage that she gets, and how easy it is to proc your passive as well, uh, it's just really easy to harass melee champions. Which means that every time he walks up to try and clear the wave, you just throw damage out, and he won't have that much magic resistance at early levels. So you can really bully him around, and when you run an Ignite and you hit the level 6, you do actually have the potential to solo kill him, or at least generate the pressure to give your jungle the option to actually invade and do some stuff. Once he gets some magic resistance, that's when it becomes really boring for a Akali, and she can't really do anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, but until then, I do feel that the Akali can do something. And I'm excited to see both mid-jungle duos of course, for different reasons. I think if Plugo gets ahead, that helps Teal. If Teal gets ahead, that helps Plugo. There's certainly a lot to work with there as Kira already getting aggressive. Interesting. Started with the E on the Galio instead of the Q. Wants to just get in the face of uh, Plugo a little bit. Does dodge out from that Q as well. So Kira again. Ooh, very nice E. Aftershock is going to prop ah. but not do the damage. So it's the, the combination of the E with the Aftershock that makes it that much harder for Plugo to trade back into him and also provides you with some pretty solid wave clear. And the mana cost is also pretty low, so uh, I like the shift up here from Kira, working out pretty nicely. And you combine it with your passive too, and you'll have some pretty solid wave play. So, uh, good adaptation there to give you a little bit more power in terms of the early trading. And it will force Plugo into tower, but here comes Tier 1. Yep, again, level 2 after that, Crab very quick to try and pressure mid. Wave's in a good spot for it, but Kira, playing respectfully, will back away from the potential pressure. Tier Wolf, though, maybe has his mind on other things. He's going to go Crab to Crab here after that blue buff. And uh, Diamond is not in sight. He's busy on the Krugs. So that will be double crab there for Teal. Nate even rotating down just to get some vision and to make sure nothing bad has happened. Did they see that blue one? Yes, they did. Uh, KLG just wanted to make sure that they will be able to secure this objective. Diamond Prox knowing that the risk of an invade was real. So he's just going to do a full bot side clear. He wants to try and steal some stuff away himself, but he's going to realize, ah, there's, uh, there's nothing here. So that's a little bit unfortunate. 
Okay, well, as a result, he's going to get the blue and the Gromp. I'll have to settle just for the wolf camp there for Diamond Prox. Well, this kind of feels bad. Diamond, of course, very famous for his ability to out and out-jungle people, but a lot of people have learned from his ways since very far back in the day. So t for the good aggressive part. With some intelligent choices, will find himself pretty comfortably ahead here in the early game. Yep. Got a mark to boot as well, which always feels good as can do. So, we talked a little bit about like win conditions, what both teams are looking to do, you know. To reiterate Gambit, looking largely to play through bot lane, they have the Lucian Alistair, which is really good uh, duo, uh, largely into the Kaiser, who can't really threaten that much. You can already see down towards the bottom lane, there's a lot of pushing, they're being forced underneath their tower, they're going to take a bit of harassment, and that's just kind of what you'd expect from a Lucian, who did receive a small buff on recent patches, and you know, it was Freak who was telling me, you know, I actually think he's going to come back into the meta. I was a skeptic, but clearly I was proven wrong, we've seen him a couple times today. Um, and they're going to want to do that once they hit the level 6 mark gladly, but Dimebrock's going for an invade. Kira abandoned him, actually. Kira could have been set up for a potential kill. Plugo invis will not get taunted out either. A Teal almost gave out the bust, and now it's Diamond that's in trouble. A good knock-up though from Kira, as Kira also going to be forced to flash away as Nate rotated down on the Urgot. So a lot of summoner spells used around the middle lane, and we see a bit of a trade-in bot. Oh, again, getting aggressive, but a door put up there by Braum is slow. Prevents so much of the incoming damage. Lodicto still moving up, trying to get the love taps down in on to fix. That was very aggressive from the bot lane of Gambit. Flash and Ignite used for only the heal of fix. I think um, they were pretty ambitious with the amount of damage output that they thought they were able to throw out. Remember that there is a Braum that can just, you know, use his shield to mitigate all the damage from the, uh, the Lucian. Uh, so unfortunately for Gamma's bot lane, they couldn't really find much off the back of that, aside from a bit of pressure. And now the Gamma bot lane will be moving up, but here's Tewolf sitting in the jungle. Yep, again, with double buffs, so pretty threatening here. Edward also no flash, here's the TP in from Gamma, though. Edward gonna try and turn it back around, they want the buff! Donation successful! Ludic, he's gonna pick it up, and there's the taunt as Kira collapses, and Plugo goes down, and Edward, he'll be the sacrifice here for the team. Run, Edward, he's run. just gonna, you know, have some fun and fix. Unfortunately, does get the kill. Caleb will be happy with that. That trade. Well, two for one in favor of Gambit. Things looked a little dire at first glance. I was like, oh no, Edward, he's gonna get collapsed on. He has no summoner spells. Um, and KLG are all there coming in from all angles, but the damage from Gambit and the response time as well was just absolutely fantastic. As this replay will be brought to you by Ace of Predator. You can see immediately the teleport comes in, and Lodic and Edward just have so much damage, and there's no flash from Tier Wolf, which means that they're able to quickly get that kill. Lugo then gets abandoned because he's in a four versus three situation, uh, and so he has to give a life, his life away as well. And while Vix gets a kill, and that's pretty good for KLG, the Lucian is ahead, the Galio is ahead, magic resistance has started to come through for the side of Gambit, and now Kira is level six. So that Gambit win condition of playing through bot is now set up in an even better situation. Nate just TP'd on a control wall to protect that Scottacrow. It was a bounty. Okay, that makes a little bit more sense. But clearly, very much rallying around the jungle as Tewolf will get that mark. Not so bad, I guess, for the spell book. Oh, God. Because Nate's going to get the lane pushed in here as well. But certainly the texture of the map changes a lot now that Kira is level 6. Also more pressure here for Plugo, but starting to take uh, some pretty hefty damage in his trades. Kira looking good on the Galio so far, and we have seen Diamond get somewhat proactive in the jungle. I think, again, now that Kira is able to be so much more mobile with the Galio and the ulti at the ready, expecting that bot lane pressure to continue to mount here. And you know, coming into this matchup, we were going to talk a lot about the two junglers and the differences and how they will be really important in this matchup. And you think back to their series throughout the day and they didn't have the best of performances. You can see that in terms of their KDA, it was pretty low. Their team jungle proximity, Tearwolf did spend a lot of time around his laners, but wasn't really able to pull much off. And unfortunately, their goal differences were pretty low just because they fell so far behind G-Rex. But coming into the tournament, we were like, okay, these two will be the focal point for these teams. Diamond Prox in their final was a big catalyst for how they were even able to win the final limit. If a play is going to happen, it happens as a result of Diamond Prox, for the most cases on the side of Gambit. And for KLG, it's the same thing for Tier Wolf, except in the early game. He's all about early game aggression, finding kills, trying to snowball his lanes. And if he's not doing that, then KLG often struggle. But they're just so good at finding early leads. You know, Shock said the stat earlier, 90% win rate when they have a lead at 15. 
but so far he has not been able to find the lead against any of the teams in his group. He's currently 0 and 1 on the Kindred, and every time he tries to make a play, teams, uh, well like Gamut and G-Rex just seem to be very good at kind of denying that and shutting that down. So Eyes will continue to be on Tier Wolf to see if he can find some kind of early game comeback for KLG, but also for Diamond Fox. How often is he going to look to move around bot lane? How well can he utilize the already strong load? You can see Tier Wolf trying to fight Kira. Blue buff actually over to Diamond, but makes sense on a mage jungler. Double offs here and level 6 for the Talia. The Tier Wolf going to have to be a bit careful in the exchange, especially with Galio just to the right. Talks about Plugo as well, someone we maybe expected to have more of an impact on the Akali pick. Still has time, of course. Akali just kind of farming it out. Kira's been playing the lane well, just kind of keep it even and keep it pushed. But Plugo can take over in an instance for the playmaker like Akali. We'll see if KLG can find those opportunities as well. But so far for Gambit, things seem to be going pretty well according to plan. Everything looking pretty good for them. And it's one of those situations where they're. The scaling isn't the best, right? When you no. kind of compare it pound for pound, you kind of think, okay, Kaisa, when they have three items, I kind of give the edge to her as a champion. You kind of look at Akali and her ability to threaten the backline. Like, she could very easily just kill either Diamond Prox or Lodic. There isn't the, the best peel on the side of Gambit. And if Plugo can pull that off in a late game fight, well, then a lot of the damage suddenly disappears from the side of Gambit. So, in terms of scaling, I kind of give the edge to KLG, but that's never really been their strength. No. We talked a lot about the early game leads and how Tear Wolf is the big catalyst for that. Um, but for Gambit, their composition being a little bit more early to mid game focused, right now, as long as they just keep utilizing their pressure, they should be in a good spot. As Tear Wolf now looking for a game. Yep, 3v2 on the bot side. Edward already popped Unbreakable Will, but that will be enough to dissuade the rest of that attempt. Plugo also roaming down as well, but fortunately will not get too much out of this. And Kira even rotates down just to make sure. He can be in alt range if needed, but back to mid lane there to push things in. And this has been something that Kira has done a lot, playing more of his utility and control mages and enabling the rest of his team. Talk about Diamond, always someone who can get going, especially on a champion like Talia. And here's a gank setup in the bot side for Gambit. Here we go, Gambit. This is the kind of thing we want to see. Play towards bot, look at the Galio, keep your eyes on the mid lane. There's the Talia ulti. All right, and here's the Cyan. Oh, oh, very nice cut off there. Big is gonna get rotated back in into the bounce house. He goes and Stayhouse grabs the kill. Perfect execution there from Gambit, pulling off exactly what they need to do. They don't even need the Galio ulti either. Four members strong. They're looking for first blood tank. Oh, Edward flashing onto Teal. Wolf. gonna force the flash out as well. Edward now tanking the turret though, so has to walk out of turret range. Gonna tank one more shot, but barely lived through the rest of it. Nate has come down here as well. Now gonna flash forward. He's gonna try and get the lock on. Finds Lodic, but not nearly enough follow-up damage to nail that execute. Good stuff there from Gambit. They aren't quite able to secure a tower, but they find themselves a quick kill. They get a couple summoner spells out from KLG, and they're just continuing to get their bot lane ahead while putting Fix behind. And we talk so much about how this is the way in which they're going to win this game. And I love the fact that they bring Stages down, you know? They rotate him down, they don't even use the teleport, they just take advantage of his ultimate. Sure, he loses out on a bit of farm, but his win condition gets gold. And that's ultimately what matters. And this is such a big difference from the gamut from earlier, because my biggest criticism for them was they had a composition that scaled, and they kept trying to force a team that was that much stronger in the early game, and they weren't able to do it. So this time around, you can see strong early game comp, able to pull out in the bottom lane. So is like, there's nothing I can do for you, so I'm outie. Um, and then he just leaves his AD carry to unfortunately die. He did have his summoner spells, I think, so he could have flashed out from that, but ends up not doing it. Yeah, once you get hit by the Cyan ulti, not much hope left. There's a nice flick back there into Kira ulti. There's the next rock up. Tor gonna come in through, doesn't even really need it, but he's able to grab the kill onto Nate. Here's Tear Wolf. Quite a bit too late, about to get knocked around himself. He does have ulti. He's gonna buy time here for Plugo. Can Plugo make the play? There's PE1. We're gonna execute around dancing. Looking for Diamond Prox, who flashes out of the way. The next two misses. Tumble over. Here he goes. Look for the play. Finds it. Execute is good. Flashes over the wall to get out to safety. And t he'll take the farm while he's here. Oh, Stages, though, he's looking for it. Don't get out of there, man. Yeah, turret does go on now. t faction can maybe look to chase, but no flash means probably not. And we finally see Plugo's first impact there on an exchange in top lane. So, one for one. See, this is what happens when Gamut don't play around bot. <laughs> you don't gank the Urgot lane. That's your mistake. Because he's so tanky, he takes such a long time to kill. It gives time for Plugo to root it up towards the top side of the map. He helps out Tearwolf, not actually able to get a kill back. 
definitely a positive for KLG, but still overall a net loss, given that kill goes over to Gamut, more farm is lost onto your top lane tank, uh, and the bot lane is just being continued to pressure from the side of Gambit. So things still heavily in their favor, a pretty healthy gold lead. We're approaching the 15 minute mark, and some of these big first items being completed, but here we see the dive. And the setup is pretty good. The galley ult is there, but you can see just how long Nate just kind of survives for. Tearwolf is able to come through. Uh, this was definitely very, very risky, but he's like, okay, I've got Plugo coming. I should be fine. And with my ulti, I should just be able to stall long enough for Plugo to arrive. And then we talked about how squishy the Talia is and how easy it is for Plugo to get that execute. He uses ulti there to try and get the last hit. Isn't quite able to pull it off, but then uses the E to jump over the wall to get the damage. And then he just flashes out just for safety. Probably didn't need to. I don't know if there was enough damage there, but does it regardless, he gets himself a kill. Yeah, Tiofo continues to be harassed by members of Gambit as uh, they're back towards the correct side of the map as far as their composition goes this game. Continuing to apply pressure on bot lane. Of course, I'd love to get that turret. It's pretty low. Tails also doing work here in the top side of the map after that earlier pressure we just saw. So certainly some room for Gambit to knock down turrets and expand their gold and map lead even further. But... You want to grab that extra gold while you can. Doesn't feel like any of their turrets are currently in danger of getting taken down, but Gambit, even though they are likely going to get outscaled based on the compositions, I don't think their comp needs to play hyper early game aggressive to no, get anywhere. But right. they need to do stuff in the mid game to set up to kind of demolish before the Kaiser can really come online. So, I mean, the worst situation for Gambit now is to not secure these outer towers. If they're unable to do that, then the game's going to be drawn out even longer, and that's when the scaling aspect of KLG can kind of come back into the game. But as long as they use the early lead to secure these out of towers, then it becomes easier to, once they hit the two item spike, start threatening things like Dragon and Baron, force KLG into a fight that they don't want to take, and then that's how you win the game, right? So I think for Gambit, they're playing just fine. They've secured bot tower. The Drake is already down. They'll use this opportunity to push out the wave, go back to base, rotate up to top lane, and then they'll look to set up around the Rift Herald, which can be used to either take mid or top tower. They can then get a bit of deep vision towards the top side of the map, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of like your textbook play of how to yep. use the, the early to mid game advantage. Um, and KLG will just kind of look to kind of find picks or objectives whenever Gambit are making these rotations, whenever they're trying to move around the map, because you do have Kindred, who is pretty strong in these skirmish situations. Um, once the gun buddy is completed for Plugo as well, that's a really big item spike for the Akali. So KLG, they just need to kind of find those opportunities, lie in wait and just wait for Gambit to make those small mistakes. Are uh, going to clear out vision on the left side, of course. Now that they've rotated their duo lane up there, KLG also knowing that textbook did move their duo lane up pretty early, so able to meet the wave and buy some time for the pretty fragile looking outer turret there in top lane. Rift Herald also still on the cards. Only up for four more minutes or so, as Slow is getting harassed by Diamond. Know that they've kept Stagios up on the top side of the map. He does have TP, but they just want to zone KLG away from this tower to make taking this Rift easier, but now they're going to force a fight. Oh, Kira actually ulted in, but that Stagios already out. Gets a decent knockup, but really just time to buy for the turrets of four. They do grab it, but those cooldowns burnt maybe mean that the Rift Herald conversion isn't as easy. But they get the teleport out from Nate, which is overall a net positive, because now Stagios in a side lane has that TP advantage, and it's easier for Gambit to force things. Oh, force things. Edward in the brush as always! Double pole, Nate goes down, and that'll be Herald there for Gambit. And KLG, they tried to contest the Rift Herald, and they're not strong enough, but they're still gonna try. 4v5, perhaps? Ulti's are ready for pretty much everyone. They're gonna maybe try and steal it away here. Plugo also on the big flank side, but Edward again finds the pole into the decimate for the bounce house. And KLG, deal off ulti, but they're maybe gonna die on the back end of the play. Plugo with a Ow. great shroud dancing around the rest of the team. Pops himself away. I think he had to use ult one. He does do so and dashes out with his second hit of it. That was really impressive there from Plugo. Buying enough time for his teammates to escape means that KLG lose no extra members after what looked like a devastating engage from the side of Gambit. This is where things start off. Gambit hiding in the fog of war. He doesn't get hit by the Q from Nate, and then boom, surprise! It's the Meat Man. Well, I, <laughs> it's the Beef Man is what I meant to say as Edwards secures himself the double knockup. They find themselves another kill. And then this is where KLG just get a little overconfident. They don't need to contest this. You should just give up the objective. And then a flash in from Edward gets the flash. Double knockup once again. Tearwolf just in time gets his ulti out so he doesn't end up losing his life. 
and then here, really good use of the W from Blugo combined with the slow and just kind of being a distraction to allow the rest of his team to get away with their lives. It does do so, but cost him a few cooldowns. And in the replay, Gambit did get themselves a Cloud Drake, so equalized on that objective as well. Continuing to build up gold there. 3k ahead with still quite a lot of this map to try and take away. Although Gunblade is done now for Pluga and Gimsy's Ray Drag was done a few minutes ago there for Fix. So things are starting to come together, but like you mentioned earlier, Kaiser does need kind of that three item mark to get things going, and Lodic is rapidly approaching item number two. So Gamut now sitting at about a three and a half thousand gold lead, so they're pretty happy with the state of the game. Baron has spawned in about a minute's time now. The Baron taking speed of Gamut isn't the fastest, but they do have three big beefy tanks, so uh, they can threaten it a lot because you can just soak up the damage for such a long time, meaning that you can force KLG into situations where they have to come check and they have to come and challenge you, which is kind of what you want because that's the kind of situation where you can force a mid-game fight where you know you're stronger at that point in the game. And uh, for Gambit, that's the kind of playstyle that they will be looking for. Going to the outer turret, though, is causing a nuisance. Kira, nice taunt! Lands a big chunk of damage onto Plugo. Galio has really been very effective here in this game, although Tiwolf going to maybe try and punish Kira as he looks for a gank, but Kira dashes away. Gets down the minion wave, and Tiwolf going to have to wait for another day as Gambit are already four man shoving the mid lane. Make it three, although Seos is rotating down now. Edward again, he's gonna look for that pole. He goes straight in onto him. Slow gonna get knocked back in by the Talia W and Lodic picks up a freebie. Here comes the rest of KLG. Oh god, what an angle from Stehos. He's gonna force Tealwolf's ult. He does get the ultimate down, but Tealwolf pops over the wall. The safety Plugo though, he's gonna run out of shroud. There's Edward looking for it, but Nate buffer the dash through after the pole prize and does get to safety, but still Stehos charging up. Flick back from Diamond is gonna land and force the bust out of the Urgot. Gambit is continuing to find cooldowns here and they will take the turret as well. All right, Gambit looking pretty clean after finding that pick onto slow and just steadily backing away while chipping out on the members of KLG will secure themselves the final outer tower that stands in their way. This is when they can use the pressure that they have to get some deep vision down into the top side of the enemy jungle. But unfortunately for them, they haven't reset yet. So they have no wards in their inventory uh, and they have little that they can do to set up. So they're gonna have to go back to base, spend some of their gold, and then that's when we'll see the control wards start to come through. Yep. Again, we'll do that now. Gambit playing, I think a little less reckless this time around. It's easy with the lead, of course, but like you said, the kind of just overforced fights it felt like with a comp that really did not want to be doing it and a position that did not want to be doing that either. But I think this comp, much more Gambit style, they can force through mid-game look to build up a big lead and win in the way that we did see them win so much this year at MSI. And it was interesting because um, had the opportunity to catch up with Edward and kind of the state of the team. And he said himself to not put high expectations upon Gambit because the team has had a very, very busy split. Um, they kind of straight after MSI, they went into a boot camp and they went back to the regular season. And then they had Rift Rivals and they had other tournaments and then there were more boot camps. And coming into Wars, they were just kind of like, yeah, we're pretty tired. <laughs> like they've yeah. played a lot of League of Legends over the last couple of months. And I feel like you look back at their first game and that was part of an indication of that, right? Where the team wasn't fully aligned on how they wanted to approach the game, had execute upon their comp. But after that defeat, I think it's just a very quick and easy wake up call being like, okay, we realize what we're doing wrong. We realize how we need to change things up. And if they want to fight, if they want to challenge in this early game, the draft towards it. And that's exactly what they've done. They're trying to enable one of their strongest players in Lodic, currently sitting at 203, really healthy farm, completed two items. And overall, they're looking like very strong in the mid game, which for Gamut is kind of where they thrive best because kind of utilizing the pressure that they have is one of their strongest suits and was kind of the situation that they found the best leads during the regular season uh, of the LCA. Interesting 2v2 brewing here in the bot lane, but Nate's going to get away there from Sion and actually Alistar that was incoming. Of course, KLG had reinforcements as well. Diamond, though, looking for a straggler. He's going to get found out by the sweeper, so we'll have to give that one up. But like you said, Gambit, it's true at MSI, it's true domestically for them. Do love to win through the mid game, and that usually means the big purple worm. Baron will likely be the thing that they pay very close attention to in these coming minutes. Kira now taking absolutely zero damage from Plugo, which is why he's more than happy to hold them off on the side lane. Gambit doing what they can to steal away some of these jungle camps and overall be a pest towards KLG. 
And Nate really getting bullied out of this lane. But that's thanks to the early lead that Stagios was able to build up for himself. And now Gamma actually just grouping and sieging. And not yep. investing a huge amount into deep vision. They've got a couple of wards littered around the Baron pit. And they just want to keep the minion waves pushed up before they move towards that objective and start threatening it. One through one, actually, using Kira. As you mentioned, in the side lanes versus the Akali. Plugo for the Ignite is going to be not so hot. <laughs> going to take quite a while to run down to mid. So Gambit, I think, just playing with the position of their waves and the map and probably just waiting for that cloud trick to spawn in 25 minutes. Also, just to steal away camps, right? This is one of the things that you have when you have a really strong mid-game lead. Is, ooh, here we have a bit of a skirmish. Everyone looks to try and disengage, but Slow already took so much damage. Kira is going to ult in. Lonic, though, is going to try and get the damage down, but Egwood with the Ignite. A bit of finish off the last remaining help of Slow, and now Stay Health unstoppable, just going to keep chasing down. He finds Plugo. He is going to get the knock up through the Shroud, but he can't see after that. Still, the turret did fall down, so Gambit get out alive and take the objective. Yeah, I like the confidence there from Gamut. They recognize that Lugo rotated down faster, which meant that KLG actually had the numbers advantage, but the moment a small skirmish picked off, immediately Kira ulties in and joins the fray. Then with the fight ensuing, Slow gets called out just like he did last time. The knockback from the Talia into the burst damage from the rest of the Gambit members allow them to secure another tower. They're going to get the second one off the back of it as well. And they don't need the Baron. They're just grouping, forcing, and they're coming out ahead. Yeah, probably going to get this Cloud Drake as well. No, maybe going to recall Diamond in the area. So potentially just going to solo this one down. And Gambit certainly looking a whole lot cleaner just after one game here. Granted, a different opponent, of course, so tough to say exactly how all the things are adding up as Kira TP's back to mid. He's gonna get down that wave and wants to keep up the pressure that he's been able to put on. KLG kind of knows, all right, we don't have that much we can control right now. We're gonna try and apply pressure. Left side is best side, because Baron is a big deal, but Stayos, another great drift on the Scion. Gonna try and grab slow, but he teleports across the rift. Stand behind me plus Flash gets himself out to safety. KLG being forced away from the Baron though. After Gambit went to reset, KLG got a couple of wards down and now Gambit are like, nope, I'm afraid this area of the map belongs to us. You do not have permission to be on our land. You will now face the cow and you will be escorted from the premises. And uh, KLG now at such a big gold deficit with this Scuttle Crab will give them a bit of information as to when that is starting off. The Gambit, they need to get control over their side lanes a little bit. They do still have the teleport on Sejo, so I expect him to go back down towards the bot lane to threaten that and push it out. Gambit also need to move in towards the enemy jungle, and to do that, they need mid priority. So you'll see Lodic and Edward moving back towards that lane, clearing that out, and then they'll group up with Kira to get a couple of deep wards down. You can see in their inventory all the control wards they have and the sweeper that's on the back of Diamond, and this will be used to just clear out the top side of the jungle and then either look for a pick or just threaten the Baron to start a fight. Yep, no need to change much from their previous lane configuration. Gonna wait out this speed train there as well, which is timing out in a little bit. KLG again, probably need to start thinking about, okay, when do we think is a good opportunity to pick a fight? They're never gonna get the ideal opportunity at this rate. But do they wait for Fix to get that third item or do they have to kind of go on two or two and a half? Tough decisions to make around the Baron and Gambit are playing it pretty well to starve them away from these areas. I think the best case scenario for KLG is either getting a quick assassination onto Diamond Prox or Lodic. It's definitely possible if you kind of combine Plugo and Fix's ability to quickly dive onto the back line. But that's easier said than done against the Galio with his ulti and his W and then the Alistair if you're waiting for an engage. So you kind of need Gambit to start the fight and then you find a flank onto the back line. I'd say that's your best case scenario if you can't afford to wait until the late game. But I feel like Gambit don't need to. They can very easily force and threaten the Baron and put KLG into a situation where they don't get that kind of a favorable fight. Um, which means that you know, Gambit secure the Baron and then they can win the game. But right now they're actually just grouping and pushing towards towers. They're not using the Baron at all. Theos is back on the bullying Nate again. Oh, goodbye. Deal if you had ulti and flash, but apparently didn't use them. Gambit demolished the poor jungler. I'm going to take the turret as well. Whew. Looks like Gambit are having lamb for dinner as they found a very quick kill onto Kindred. Tearwolf drops, which means another tower falls as well. The jungler being gone means that the Baron can be started off. I can't even really blame Tearwolf there either. Whatever happened, happened so yeah, fast. Yeah, super fast. The CC from Alistair was more than enough to get the quick kill. 
And now Kelji doing what they can. If they lose this Baron, they know it's going to be that much harder. Oh, Kira again finds the quick taunt there onto Slow. Edward also going to zone them out of the way. Plugo getting himself knocked around. Going to get restunned there as well after the trample. Kira over. He's going to zone them all out. That's an easy Baron there for Gamba. And Kira actually gets a knock off. Kind of solos up Plugo as Teos drifts into the jungle to try and take down Slow Fix. He's forced to flash away, but Lodic is going to chase him down slow likely gonna die does dash to a mini with his w and now fix forced to burn his own killer instinct but lodic just runs him down and takes him out and that's two members dead now for klg gambit they've looked convincing throughout this entire game 28 and a half minutes they have two minion waves pushing in and they're looking to secure themselves two quick inhibitors yep top is gonna be forfeit pretty swiftly teal back Trying to defend, forced to flash away. Kira, he's gonna make him pay. That taunt just clips him and he dies again before able to, able, able to use that ulti. And now a double knockout by Slow and Nate retreating back towards the fountain. And Gambit is gonna look to take down these Nexus turrets. Almost playing with their food as Edward is knocking people around, but they're just buying space to take down these turrets. Nate knocked up, Righteous Glory is in, and Kira dashing back around. Edward again re-engages on the Alistar. Plugo, a last ditch ever with a big flank here, trying to find a snipe in onto a carry, but Lodic will dance around. The rest of Gamma will protect him. Plugo actually does find the shutdown in onto Lodic, but I don't even know if that's enough at this point. The Nexus, it is exposed. KLG will try and fight them off. But Kira, he finds a great kill again onto Plugo, and the Nexus will fall down Gambit. They really clean it up, and they'll even things out on day number one. They will hold the second place in this group for the time being. Gambit looking much better compared to their earlier game. We'll just certainly give Gambit fans a little bit more confidence as they go into their rematch against G-Rex, who looked very good after today's performance, but KLG feel like we just haven't seen from them what we expected. Early game aggression was kind of the expectation that was built around this team based on how they play in the early game, how they play during the regular season and in their region. Um, but they haven't been able to do that. They've been shut down multiple times in the early game. Their drafts are a little wonky, a little all over the place. It doesn't feel like they have very clear win conditions. And uh, unfortunately for them, they are now sitting at 0-2 in this group, which will definitely make the climb that much harder. Um, but still possible. They will have to find wins against both GRX and Gambit on day three of the playing stage. Um, but definitely things looking rather challenging for KLG right now. And again, it is a quick turnaround, but I think all the teams that have played today can take a lot of learning from this. Again, no one really knew what people were playing except from whatever they got in scrims. I think things will develop pretty rapidly as they often do in the early stages of a tournament. I think KLG... You're right, they're going to draft a little wonky, maybe picked a few too many styles to go. I think either enable Plugo or Tilworth, don't try and enable both, because that yeah. feels like a bridge too far. I agree. I think that they just need to decide on lane that they want to play around and then just hard commit to it, because this is not the tier wolf that we saw from MSI, right? And even though the team didn't have the strongest performance in terms of wins, we saw so much aggression from Tier Wolf, where he was just constantly fighting enemy junglers, trying to snowball lanes, look for early leads, and we need to see that Tier Wolf if KLG want to stand a chance of making it top two in this group. And I think for Gambit, you found your style. It was there all along, as you expected. Yeah. This is a team that just kind of helped themselves, I feel like. Even historically, these players love to go in and engage. Egwit is famous and infamous in many ways for how aggressive he likes to be on his support. So I think Gambit, they found their style. It may be a bit narrow, but they're going to stick to it, and it's likely going to give them some wins. Yeah, I hope that going into their rematch versus G-Rex, they don't give away three losing lanes. Yeah, they do a have a lane idea. that they can play around next time, but that will be on day three. We have the other two groups playing off, but that does it for, it to, for us today. Basically. Well, certainly at least for us, but now to break down this and every game from day one of Worlds, it's time to turn it over to Worlds Cooldown. Yeah, thank you very much, and welcome to World's Cooldown. Uh, we're going to look back at the first day of competition at World 2018 in Seoul, and this is what you can expect after every show at Worlds. We're just going to cool down, literally, figuratively, I don't know, like both. It was a spicy day. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Cool down. It could have been better. I mean, we were already talking about it. We'll get into it. If C9 lost, it yes. would have been better. Uh, yes, but. I'm still pissed off. Yeah, well, you're going a bit fast. Let's first, uh, let's first wrap up Group D. Of course, it 
ended with this clash we just saw of Gambit versus Chaos Latin Gamers. And I have to say for my part, um, I was really surprised, pleasantly surprised, by how Gambit recovered after what honestly was a horrible first game out of them earlier in the day. So they had a bit of time, and that's what I really value. Because remember, you get a lot of information off the game, off the first game. For them, it was the fact that they couldn't get out of the lane. They were locked in these really tough laning bases, which is a very good team in the lane. So a lot of that was understanding that they just need better picks. And especially based off the draft that they were given here. I think that they had a lot of great counter pick options because enemy team just decided to power pick a lot. Well, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, but I think with that you also say, how the hell did they get their hands yeah. on like Urgot and Akali and Kaisa and yeah. Brown? This is definitely a draft where you kind of look at KLG and say like, you know, you the buffet, everything. take whatever you want. Yeah. They, they took everything and I think they got a little bit too far down the rabbit hole with the Kindred pick. I think, you know, maybe a tank jungler of some kind would have been better for setting up these lanes uh, because you know, Gambit, while not using power picks, did have a pretty cohesive draft with Galio Talia to go to side lanes and dive. And like you said, with the counter picks, they kind of have winning lanes. And so, you know, they did give up a lot to get that strategy working. And I think KLG could have done a little bit better job with the tools. Yeah, to your point, Raz, I think it does uh, speak in Gambit's favor that they gave a lot of those things over and had a well-crafted plan against it. However, my remark was kind of like, don't do that against every team. Probably. It's yeah. kind of a lot to give over, but uh, I just also want to speak to the fact that they bounced back. You know, Edward had not a good game in his first game of the day. That Thresh was not something we're looking at. I really enjoyed his Alistar, for instance, now. Diamond, although his early jungling was not the best, like, they all, they rebounded pretty well, and that's what you need in this best-of-one scenario. Yeah, I liked it. I liked the fact that they were cool, calm, and collected in the, in the sense that they understood that preparation, getting the draft is in order, so talking about the draft didn't really paid off. But just individual performance. I understand that the Thresh, he was called Thresh Bits historically. Like, yeah. he made his career a lot of it off of, sure, the Sona, but the Thresh as well later on in season three. So, didn't pay off, but he just went back towards the Alistar and the headbutt pulbs were actually paying off. You talk about individual performances. Our MasterCard player of the game was Kira in this one. Um, well, Kira is someone that we've been following since the Albus Knox Luna days. That was kind of his breakout performances. And now um, I haven't really seen that much highlights from him in recent years on the international stage. So I hope we can see a bit more of that for Gambit. He does still feel like one of the more consistent members for them. And I think this was a good game for him where his job was not smashing, you know, someone else in lane. It was about getting out with the rest of his team and working well with them. And like you said, they had set up in a lot of the lanes and he was able to do a good job collapsing and being the biggest catalyst as well as being able to say, you take a Kali, I'll pick for the team. And that's the thing. This team is so creative uh, during the year. They've always been a team with the most hectic compositions. This time around, it was the most grounded comp mm -hmm. imaginable. It must have been a boring game for that Galio because honestly, it was like, find yourself in a side lane, now come back mid lane, and now just bulldoze through it because Akali's not going to find it in side lane the moment they set up the side lane waves and just had a large enough wave to just bulldoze through. So I really like the fact that they were disciplined near the end of the game. Yeah, I think uh, that's what sometimes is lacking from them, is not being disciplined enough, so it was good to see. Yeah, it was. So if we didn't tally up Group D so far, uh, Chaos Latin Gamers left without a win, 0-2, and two, Gamut at 1-1, one and one, and G-Rex, the surprise of the day, I would say, for many, maybe together with that donation, focus me, 2-0. and zero. Now, G-Rex is the third seed coming out of the LMS, um, and they definitely surprised me. They came out swinging. They had fantastic early games. MT was an absolute monster today. So for people who didn't catch the games, how good was he? He was incredible. I think that his pathing to keep his lanes safe was mostly important because a lot of time it's actually on the lanes to make the jungles look good. If you're playing really well and communicating with your jungler, then it's easier for your jungler to go towards mid lane if he knows the wave's piling up. A lot of that, MT had a great understanding where he needed to be. So he got a Skarner pick. He made it worthwhile, and I think that empty coming into this is a jungler to watch. It was a group where we were saying it might be the most open group, and we haven't seen A and B yet, but so far, actually, compared to C, feels very separate, where it's like, here's G-Rex, dominant laners, still have pretty good team synergy, and, you know, uh, Gambit and KLG are just not up to snuff quite yet. So, yeah. like, it does surprisingly feel like the more decided the two groups. I think that's fair. We are just setting up for an interview with Gamut as well, a winter, uh, a winter, w winter interview. It is winter, I guess, right? Go. In some parts of the world. Not here. Not everywhere. It's hot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so in any case, when we then button up this group, it also means that Chaos Latin Gamers is left without a win. I'm definitely a bit disappointed what I've seen from them today. Now, when I was talking to their expert, Tommy, one of the casters of the CLS, I talked to him about Tyrolof and I said, well, he's getting a lot of hype. You know, we looked at him a lot at MSI and he said, well, they're maybe a chance that he goes a bit too far with all of that and that it turns in from being aggressive to being 
too overconfident and too aggressive. And maybe that Kindred pick here and the play plays into that story. It's something we should track. Yeah, the Kindred's one. The other one was the Zin Zhao. I think the one, the largest disappointment for me for Tier Wolf was that he's very brute forceous in a lot of the plays that he makes throughout the mid lane. Uh, there was one time throughout mid where I was like, he's camping for a kill. I was like, what are you trying to do here? Because Ryze already got his base, so he doesn't need a base in that instance. You're either looking for a gank, but that's such a slow push that you're just going to be there for days. A lot of time, in that, in that moment, he actually just walked out, had to flash out because the counter gank came through. And so there are a lot of times that I'm wondering what he's trying What's to gain plan, out of it, yeah. what the plan is, because it hasn't been thought through. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want to just call one person out. I think for KLG, nothing is really working so far. Uh, what are your thoughts as to how this group is going to evolve? Is this G-Rex clear favorite number one, Gambit number two, or are things going to move? For me, it feels pretty decided, like I said. Like, G-Rex just looks too good individually for these guys to, to be able to break out of. I did like what I saw out of Gambit here, where, like, a very team map-oriented game plan, and I would like to see that against G-Rex, where you don't have to worry about the individual matchups quite as heavily. But even then, like I said, I didn't feel like G-Rex looked bad in team situations, so I don't think uh, they have a great chance for them. And, and KLG, with Tier Wolf supposed to be, like, their big playmaker, hasn't seen that show up yet is concerning. And I still predict the G uh, Gambit uh, near the end of the day to take it. I think we both did because yeah, I was I didn't. willing. Yeah, I did. Nice to call it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I was we're willing. Those, to... We're going to get a full screen soon? <laughs> yeah, well, at soon. Hold Later. On. We got we to gotta stash it. Uh, I was willing to have some faith because at one first game, if you just lose every lane at that point, you can easily say, we'll just fix it off the draft. Yeah. We'll have some faith that when we get to the team fights, they're a great team fighting team, but they didn't get to that point. Uh, so now they had the opportunity, recognizing that, sure, the three incredible power picks were there, but the Akali has a lot of weaknesses. A lot of people just, um, I know in the LPL, a few teams just decide to give it away just because they know that they can either push into it and play through the 2v2 mid and go bot, or the Galio and just team fight it because mm -hmm. a lot of times Akali just doesn't have clear split push conditions. So that's the major takeaway is that it's very difficult to play with an Akali once you get to those team fights. Is that the main the takeaway for KLG as a whole? They need to recognize <laughs> that lane phase is nice and all. There's okay. There's a they lot. They need to think work. about team fights as well as the power picks. And there's drafts. a lot of things. The, the power picks are one point. The picks are one point. But also, just a lot of it is just the subtlety and how they play. The vision control isn't very thought through, and uh, support jungle are not really working. Basically, well you say they have a lot of work to do. Well, yeah, we'll see them in day three. Yeah, Raz is like ah. Okay. There's a lot. So uh, let's then move on to another team where there's a lot of work to be done. Just kidding. Uh, C9 in Group C uh -huh. is. They are reigning supreme so far. They are two and zero. That nation focus me is currently in second place. But man, was this dicey. If you guys didn't see this game, there's a bit of a spoiler. But Marxy, break it down for us. What happened here? Well, it was a game where uh, <laughs> they tried to branch out a little bit more. Usually when they take things like the Kindred, they want to combo with a control mage mid or a galley or something. That didn't happen. And then apparently there's a chance there might have been some bad information. I was talking to Jat. And he said that he saw a tweet from Westrice where he said that uh, the Kindred ultimate can be used. Uh, Who is on the support staff for C9, which, right? Yeah, yeah, he's the assistant coach for C9. Uh, said that you can use the Kindred ult while getting ulted by the uh, Urgot and stop his ultimate. And then he deleted that tweet. He had a response to that tweet that is still up, which says it shouldn't work that way, but it does. So I couldn't find the original tweet because he deleted it. I couldn't confirm it So myself. you're saying, just to be clear, exactly. that there was faulty information coming from the C9 support staff as to how that interaction works, which is probably because everyone's pitchforking blabber for uh, what happened in that game in the beginning. So Right. In the interview, he, he actually said, I was tanking them. Like, intentionally, it sounded like getting into fights with Urgot to bait the ultimate out, and then he would just get ulted and killed because you can't drop it during it. So I, yeah. I, I don't quite know what they thought happened. Uh, it's nice if you get a QSS and then you can ult whoever Urgot ults and save yourself, but they didn't prioritize the QSS. Yeah. The accuracy of the Urgot for me was just stark because he yeah. was hitting him every single time. I think Urgot ulti, it's really making a name for itself in terms of how often it's being missed. It's compared mm -hmm. to like the Verisault. But this time around, it's been hitting Blabber multiple times, and he wasn't going towards the QSS. He wasn't prioritizing it, obviously. Got a third item, and that's a pretty pi pricey build that he actually got from But in the end, they got it, and Cloud9 turns there it around. Uh, and I, I just wanted to jump on that, that you said the Urgot ult, but Evie was destructive on that pick, and that Nation Focus Me in general really had a good showing here today. Yeah, very good. The fact that Evie in team fights, because he's been great in lane, but when he brings it to the team fights on the Urgot, that's just destroying a lot of what the composition for C9 is really being built for, is to out-survive. And so 
If you don't have the ultimate coming in from Kindred, then you're really waiting on Lissandra, and that's not a lot of time if you're comparing the tanks that Urgot's being able to, you know, buy some time with. Yeah, I think Detonation had the best combination of, like, power picks plus their own meta working together. I think a lot of their comps made sense where they're taking Varus and Kindred, but they're also slapping a Karma in the mid lane, which no one else is really doing, and then here with the Ziggs to be able to survive the dive, and then Urgot would just go, like, 1v3 the back line, so... I liked a lot of what I was seeing from them. I agree. Uh, we going to an interview in just a second. I want to button up kind of the C9 story. And you, Marx, were like, being such a fan of NA during that game, you were ready to say, like, I heard things like, well, if C9 gets through and get in a group, they're going to lose anyway. So Hold what on. do you have Wait. to say I said for yourself? Group B specifically. All right. I said group B is the group of death. Everyone says that. Yep. Like, I was saying, even if C9 loses this game, I'm actually not too upset because... <laughs> It's like, I want to see, like, if they end up in the second seed and you have to play versus G2 or EDG, is that really that much worse than getting just thrown into Group B? You know, I was saying C9 actually has other routes forward beyond just, like, get one seed, it's All a right. beat okay, a two okay, seed. Okay, okay, okay. It's a hard life for NA right yeah, now. Yeah, no, it's good. Uh, I like it. Uh, we just wanted to throw you under the bus. No, but I yeah, love, we're just I love getting to know each other on the desk for the first time. We need to throw out some punches. Uh, however, I'm going to deflect because we have Avali standing by as he uh, caught up, uh, as she caught up, rather, with Diamond Prox after their win. I'm here with Diamond Proxy Jungler for Gambit. Congratulations on that win. And in that last game, you guys looked a lot more composed and put together than game one. So what really clicked and what needed to happen for you guys to come together as a team? Uh, I think we just needed to lose. <laughs> yeah, when, when we put ourselves in a situation where our backs are against the wall, that's where we play the best. Well, that's perfect. High pressure, high stakes. That's what Worlds is all about. And I mean, speaking of which, last year you guys had a kind of a rough showing at Worlds. So what does it really mean to the team to end today on a win? Mm, I think it means a lot for the team to not go 0-2 in the first day because otherwise, like, everyone was going to think if uh, something has changed over the year. Like, we know that a lot has changed and we improved a lot like as a team, as a players, but when you will still go 0-2, something will go, might go wrong in your mind and your mindset might be like somewhat bad. But now uh, we showed that we are better than the year before, that we can actually win games. And now it's only up to us to continue this kind of like play in the future. And from what I understand, you guys didn't have an easy path to get here to Worlds today. Um, so. What really was your journey like to kind of achieve Worlds? Oh, it was a crazy journey, actually. <laughs> if Spring Split uh, was kind of easy, and then MSI was really fun but hard, but then we didn't have much break be between MSI and future tournaments like Rift Trials, and then we had some like r random tournament in Russia that we played also. So without rest, we played all the tournaments I think really good but we were very very tired during the whole uh, summer split uh, season like uh, even regular season we were very tired and because of that uh, we struggled a lot even like getting out of the regular season we were two times we were one game away from not getting to playoffs and then after we got to playoffs uh, in the first semi-final we were down 0-2 and then we're about like to lose the fourth game too but somehow mi like miraculously we managed to come back and win the whole thing and then get the world so that's pretty great like this whole year for us is I think um, a really good showing that we can do that we can do good as a team, but Worlds obviously is the biggest stage and we want to prove that we can do good things even on the biggest stage. Busy split, sounds like you put in a lot of hard work and today it paid off. Wish you the best of luck with your upcoming games this week and thank you so much. Well, then, there we go. Thank you so much, Avli. Wonderful interviews, uh, your first day at Worlds as well. Diamond had a lot to say. He just wanted to emphasize that it's been a busy year, but. Getting a win at the end is good because you don't want to go 0 2. Look, it was just a deep sigh because <laughs> he mentioned it. They had a lot to go through throughout the entire split. There was a real slump there. And remember, just a nitpick, you know, just a little tidbit is that for Summer Split, a lot of the teams that really focused on their AD carries took a big hit just because it was a mage, bruiser meta. And so this was a big problem where 
uh, they really focus on the young gun and Lodic. Mm -hmm. And so when a lot of that's not going to plan, they have to change their style or really just power through. So a lot of that was hitting them at the same time. All right, let's take a look then at the standings. With that, Gambit uh, saves their bacon a little bit and goes one and one in the end in Group D. G-Rex is their reigning supreme, KLG without a win. And then the tally up for Group C, Cloud9, two and zero. Detonation folks me one and one. And Kaboom, we haven't mentioned them yet, went zero two today. They opened up the day by losing to Cloud9 and then also lost to Detonation Focus Me. Whew, I'm definitely a bit disappointed. Um, I'm not going to say the CBLOL teams have been amazing in the last couple of years, but they've always done better than this, right? They've definitely put up a, a fight in the group stages. So I wonder if they're going to bounce back. Yeah, they've punched above their weight a few times. Better than what's happening here. I think this is a major upset between LJL and CBLOL. The fact that this has happened. That being said, they've had great nuggets, like the fact that the laning phase has been good in one of their games, and I thought the team fights have been back to forward. It's just the result is what matters. Mm -hmm. And so for them to lose a lot of these crucial team fights is just not working out for them on day one. It's definitely disappointing, but it's nice to see for the LJL yes. on the flip side because yeah. they've been one of the, the regions that at MSI play-ins and world play-ins have always come up not just short, but like usually on the bottom. And it's it's nice to see them finally starting to climb that ladder, which is what you want to see out of emerging regions. Absolutely agree. Fantastic job by them. Let's also take a look at our predictions so far. <laughs> they were horrible, from my side at least, I think. I think I did all right. Let me see. Uh, I got one wrong. Oh! oh it's almost as if me and Mark literally just went through the exact It's almost like you guys are actual analysts. <laughs> yeah, that is, well, I was like, I don't know how, but like whoever I'm doing predictions with, we always end up pretty similar. Like Jack Matt and I always have the same uh -huh. predictions, it feels like. Now Raz and I, apparently. Uh, it's, it's fair to say also that I think a couple of things did go against expectation. We all got that Kaboom one wrong because we thought they would come out a bit stronger. Yeah. And then that the nation focused me surprised a lot of people. So I wasn't sure Gambit was going to bounce back. They remember, did, so. A lot of these are really clear-cut grooves, too. C mm. and D felt like it was going to be very easy. I think the major surprise, as you already mentioned, was Detonation focused me coming out ahead. I hope we get more of that. I just hope that... The next time we get something like this, they can finish the game. You know, Elder yeah, Dragon, so Baron, just get it. Uh, that's unfortunate. Well, they have another chance in two days against yeah, C9. Uh, well, I hopefully. think in general, it's cool that the groups aren't exactly playing out as clear cut as you think. Like G Rex coming out so swinging is throwing that group a bit into disarray as well. So we'll be exciting to see how that evolves. Yeah, even just their first win over Kaboom is just like, this is what we we're saying. You know, you want to see out of worlds is that things don't go according to plan. That's what makes it the most exciting point of the year is that all these kind of bubbles that are isolated from each other finally start interconnecting and nothing ever sticks to the plan. Yeah, great plan and also some players, great plan, great point, nothing sticks to the plan, but our MasterCard players of the game did follow the plan. So <laughs> we have a couple of those. In the first game, we saw C9 Liquors pop absolutely off. He destroyed Kaboom almost on his own, right? So I think even though he had kind of a questionable Lissandra in the last game, I think he deserves praise for his world's debut on day one. Definitely a fighter uh, player for the most part, yes. does play some tanks. Lissandra as a mage, not exactly his specialty, but you saw what he can do when on his comfort picks and absolutely destroyed in the first game. Star of the day, empty from G-Rex. Uh, yeah. This guy, yeah, he absolutely deserved. He set up everything for that team and they had two very convincing games. And remember, this team was the one that had a lot of questions about their jungle position. Mm -hmm. They couldn't bring in Raze, the Korean jungler, because they already had two in their roster. And so, empty should have been, like, between him and Bebe, they bought in both of them. One of the weaker ones. But I thought the last series that he had in the uh, gauntlet tournament was very strong. So they gave him the shot and he's already just, it's paying off. I'm saying thank you for that spot. And, uh, yeah, there we go. I'm going to take it. Canadian born as well. So there's a total of four <laughs> North American players on that board. All right. Uh, so <laughs> tomorrow, <laughs> there's, uh, well, more games, six more games and also six more teams making their World 2018 debut. Groups A and B are going to start their run. Oh man, EDG versus yes. Infinity, G2 versus Supermassive, Direwolves Infinity, Ascension. Oh man, this is so incredibly uh, exciting. So let's talk about some of these matchups and, and some of these groups. I'm looking at maybe the first game. Let's start with that. Let's do chronological because I want to talk about G2 Supermassive. And I love but. the fact <laughs> you're doing that because EDG, third seed from China. I really want to see more from this team because if we're talking about LPL specific, a lot of us, the analysts in the LPL, didn't expect this team to go through. Mm -hmm. We expect them to be fourth slash fifth, you know, top team in the LPL. 
but they, at the Gauntlet Tournament, beasted through Jingdong Gaming, went straight through Rogue Wars, and while this na these names don't mean much to the audience, that just showcases that they were really bursting out at the very end off the carry pick of iBoy, really paying off in his Kaisa pick, Scout doing really well on his rise, and I thought that the team fights were just really coming out. And I thought it's interesting that they're up against the LLN because if you remember last year, the 1-2 seed matchup to get out of the play-in stage, it was uh, Lion versus uh, WE. Yes. So they have a little bit of history in the play-in stage between the LPL and the LLN. Yeah, uh, that they do. We talked a lot today about uh, teams that went through the gauntlet, started off strong here. I think the same could probably go for EDG. You know, they looked, they had to fight in that gauntlet, though. Let's not mince word here. It was very, very close. They had to come back. They had five games, but in the end, fantastic. Stuff. Yeah, very That's tough. Fun. And I think that going into the specific series, a lot of the history that you've talked about uh, is going to be very true today. Uh, the fact that, or at least tomorrow, I suppose, the fact that they're going up against really tough, like great players. Uh, Koto Paco, the uh, mid laner for the team is a very strong rise pick. So that's a very that's a shared champion pool between the two of them. They have a rookie of the year AD carry down there. We're going to be talking a lot about him tomorrow. And so great AD carries coming out of the LLN is something that we see quite often. Will yeah. be exciting. The last. Um I was gonna say I was want to make a pun about direwolves, like a wolf in the uh -oh. group or whatever. But uh -oh. anyway, direwolves are the third team in that group. So uh, and for me, it's much like a thing of like, okay, I think it could be pretty clear cut that EDG obviously gets first, and then Infinity will show up strong. But I don't really know now with the Shurn fire ban yeah. in the first couple of games. Direwolves look absolutely gutted. Let's be honest. That was that was the big problem is that uh, Shurn fire before joining on Direwolves, you know, Direwolves were zero and four or something in terms of like titles won, and then yeah. he joins, and they win the next four. Yeah, so you can see. Shurnfire was basically the catalyst for this team's rise, and then to lose him for the first two games in a you know group where potentially you could have upset yep. the LLN is, is very disappointing. I actually had coming into this, because I was just looking at all of these groups, and I thought that Direwolves was going to be coming in as a second seed. Even though the you know, Infinity is a great team fighting team and they have some great players, the jungle position, Shurnfire is very good. And he really directs a lot of the early game play and flow. So he's a great communicator from like hearing from the team. And the fact that they've lost an incredible team fighter communicator in, like has a lot in terms of the champion pool. Mm -hmm. uh, loses direction. A lot of the players now you're looking towards King in the bottom lane. Maybe he has to stop being a team fighter uh, and slow early game player, and he has to go back to the old king. You know, someone that takes risks because someone has to do that now if they have a chance here. Yeah, it's gonna be rough. Maybe it's it's kind of out of nowhere. They didn't play without boundaries or whatever. We'll have to see tomorrow. It'll be very interesting. Before we go though, just want to quickly touch also on Group B: Super Massive, Ascension, and G2 Esports. And G2 versus Super Massive is the first game we see out of that group. There's a lot of divided opinion, so I'm just gonna let you guys. Kind of shortly state what you think about the two teams and how they're going to match up. Go first. Oh, because really? I thought this was where Raz was going to go, and I was going to slowly shift out of frame. <laughs> I he... can do it. All right, I hey, can you do, it. do that shot. Let's, Let's do it. Okay, we're Let's going do to this it. camera. I'm going to... Where is he? Let's. One of these cameras, I'll find out how that you're one. doing. So immediately, for me, when it comes to Super Massive, I think one of the best players Look coming out of it, one of the best players coming out of the group stage, the play-in stage, is legitimately Snowflower. I think they have some very strong players in the bottom lane. So just from in that matchup, dot it out in your calendar. I think Supermassive is going to take it. Already, I'm All just right. putting it out there. Marjorie is That's already... the one. Yeah. Uh, bottom lane. The got. <laughs> Look at the bottom lane. <laughs> The gauntlet has been thrown. Um, Vedius has really strong feelings about G2, and I'm just going to jump in because obviously I'm from Europe, so mm. I am uh, supporting, or from the EULCS rather, so I am supporting G2 Esports. I mean, I think you make a good point uh, about the bottom lane, but it's also a bit overblown because Yarna, people always like to say bad things about yeah. Bjarne, and he's so absolutely terrible, but he really isn't if you look statistically. I do think they have an advantage, but in the rest of the map, G2 should just have that well, game. That's how I feel. It's like, even if you are right that Zeitnot destroys Yarnan or something, like, you still have Caps and it won't versus happen. GBM. Even but if it does happen, you still have Caps versus GBM. Yeah. It's disgusting this match. If you're caps? asking me who wins in a battle. Oh, excuse me, perks, perks versus. GBM. I know we all want to watch caps, but sorry, tomorrow sorry. Perks, is perks. perks it's also GBM. really. Yeah. yeah. If you're asking me who wins in a best of five, I think it comes down to G2. But remember what happened in MSI? MSI was a big takeaway of surprising players. Yeah. Now, even though I took look, take a look at the bottom lane, a lot of it was actually on GBM as well. We didn't expect much from GBM coming into the tournament on MSI, and in group stage, he came out as the look C player. Yeah. So his split pushing is great. I think they have a lot of great players on that roster that we should be watching out for.
Final Four, and it's going to be on G2 to really just play the game slowly. I do think it's going to be a phenomenal matchup. That is for sure. We'll have to see how it plays out. However, we're going to sign off for us here today, the first day at Worlds. We're going to call it at night at Lowell Park as well. So for myself, the casters, everyone, the live broadcast crew, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow for more of Worlds 2018. Nice try. We almost won. Now Seo's gonna be pulled back by the Skarner ulti. PK's got the fear and the execution as Gambit falls apart. And they go, the Orn ulti comes out. Lamster Spike is thrown down. It's gonna be secured by Detonation. Focus me! And Kaboom gets exploded! Nexus under fire. Detonation, focus me. Hell of a comeback. First victory. The zones him away. Shell, he's still grumpy. Ooh! Oh, the Greg is into the last breath. He's gonna get a triple knock Two misses, tumble over, here he goes, look for the play, finds it, executed, good, flashes over the wall, and pulls Kira over, he's gonna join them all out, that's an easy baron there for Gamba, and Kira actually gets a knock up, kind of solos up, Lugo, Blabba, oh, he gets Hulkin again, Emi gets a flash forward into the fear, and that's Carnage on the front side. Oh, I'm going Varus, I'm going Varus. Varus, 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 to push themselves 2-0 in this group, and DFM did not make it easy. And let it be known that no one ulties Blabber five times in a row and gets away with it.